Open your Bibles now, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter number 13. Our text verses will be verses number 52 through 58, the remainder of the chapter, but for time's sake, uh, we're only going to read the words of our Lord, and then the others will be referenced, of course, during the message. But for our guests, uh, we have been in a journey discovering what would Jesus do, and it's our desire to pattern our lives after the words and deeds of Jesus Christ. That's our theme uh, for this year. Uh, the message today is entitled, What Would Jesus Teach Us About Ministry? Now, uh, you that aren't in the ministry, don't turn me off and say, well, this message isn't for me. Uh, actually, it is for you. Because guess what? You are in ministry. You just didn't connect the dots uh, properly and consider that you were. Notice what the Bible said. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. We'll look at the other passages a little later, but look at verse 57 just now. And they were offended in him. Uh, so my dear friend, if you choose to get mad at the preacher, you're not the first one. Uh, and they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And I will read verse 57. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Uh, for the assembly of this great host in this place today. Uh, Lord, we pray for those that are on spring break and they're traveling and they're doing things uh, for their safety, their safe and quick return. And we uh, pray, Lord, for those special requests we've already mentioned together once again. And, Father, we pray for every heart and every mind uh, in, in this auditorium this morning. Father, may this message uh, find its way deep into our hearts and may we respond individually uh, to its challenge in a way that brings glory to you and changes our lives and helps us. Those, Lord, that have not yet trusted Christ, they don't have assurance of salvation. Lord, help them uh, to turn to you even today. I pray, help me preach. Lord, I, I feel so inadequate before such a great uh, book as this. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a couple of uh, weeks ago, we considered the last of seven parables known as the parables of the kingdom of heaven presented in this chapter by Jesus. As the Lord concluded them, he turned and asked his disciples this question. Have you understood all these things? And they said, yes. Jesus then said to them, be like a scribe. Now, a scribe was a member of a very learned 
class of, uh, of people in ancient Israel who studied Scripture, who served as copyists and uh, editors and teachers. Jesus said to those that will follow him, I want you to be like scribes. And then he said, I, I want you to be like the head of a household who has a treasure box containing things new and old. The Bible then tells us that Jesus left that area and went into his own community, uh, Nazareth and Galilee, and he taught in their synagogues, uh, but uh, they did not respond very well. In fact, they responded very negatively uh, and were offended in him. His reply was simply this. A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And that's why, you see, because of their unbelief, because they didn't want anything to do with him, that's why he was not able to do uh, his many mighty works in their lives, even though they really needed them to be done. Now, here's my guiding thoughts for the message today. I have three. First of all, there's the task of ministry. Uh, The task of ministry, listen to this, requires consecration and care. And you that will be in ministry, uh, uh, particularly might ought to make note of that. Uh, The task of ministry requires consecration and care. Secondly, the trials of ministry come from every direction. And lastly, the terminus of ministry depends upon faith both our faith and the faith of those that we speak to. It's a wonderful section of Scripture, but have you thought about the task of ministry? Now, if you are in ministry already, or if you feel that you want to get involved in ministry... Or if you're not involved in ministry and if you wonder about those that are involved in ministry, what's involved in ministry, uh, this passage will, will help you. The task of ministry requires consecration and care. Notice the text, and I want to read it again. Jesus said unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. The passage presents the task of ministry. And here's what we learn. At least three things we learn. First of all, like the scribes in ancient Israel, we must be consecrated. And we must be carried. 
You see, that that scribe never once thought to give his job less than the best. Uh, In fact, that scribe was very, very meticulous in everything that he did to make absolutely certain there was no mistakes. Uh, He wanted uh, his copyist work of of every record to be perfect. He never approached his work with a, well, it's not that important. Attitude. He approached his work uh, with the highest regard. And he gave it his absolute best. And you see, like that ancient scribe, God first tells those that will follow him that, that we must, you see, be consecrated, dedicated to the divine purpose. God's purpose. Uh, You've all heard this saying, anything worth doing is worth doing right. Now, friend, may I submit to you that anything having to do with God and anything we're doing for God is worth doing right. He's a great God. He's worthy. Secondly, like the head of a household, uh, we're to not only care about what we're doing, but we're to care about those we're doing it for. My, what a great admonition is found in this passage. Listen. Listen. I'm to take my job as husband and father or mother very seriously. You see, that's what a householder is. That's the head of a household. And gentlemen, you and I are heads of households if we're husbands and fathers. And and mothers, if you have not a husband, uh, uh, then you are head of your household over your child. And the children in your home. And this must be taken seriously. Very, we must care about those we are, are called upon to do things for. Uh, l- listen. The book of Ephesians. Chapter number 5. And verse number 21, as husbands and wives were told that we're to submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And I like that, submitting yourselves one to another, because uh, I won't say us, I should, but I, I, I'll say you, you, you gentlemen, us gentlemen. Sometimes we, we like to emphasize to our wives, now it's your place to be in submission to me. But wait just a moment, gentlemen, as a head of a household, uh, the wife, sometimes we must submit to her. Can I tell you what? Sometimes she's got more sense than you do. Amen. Sometimes she's got more sense than you do. And, uh, you, you, you know, and, and sometimes she's got more sense in the area of spiritual things uh, th- than you do. And sometimes she's more in tune with God than you are. So, and then in many other areas of life, uh, submitting yourselves one to another 
in fear of the Lord. And, and, and then notice, she said, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, that's the, the wife's duty, as unto the Lord. But notice the next verse, please. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. L- listen. Gentlemen, you are not only to be head of your home. Uh, now, the, the, the household, he said, be like a household. Now, uh, you're not only head of your home uh, in, in maybe uh, uh, carnal areas, but you're, you're to be head of your home in the spiritual area. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. The, the husband's duty is to be what's known as the spiritual head of his home. Now, let me give you a little personal testimony. Around my house, now, you don't have to do things exactly the way Pastor Rain does. I don't care whether you do or not. I'm just saying that uh, uh, this is the way I, for years... Uh, this is not always true during uh, every every day of the week. Most of the time it is. But on the Lord's Day, I get up first. Yeah. And I get up early enough. I hit the shower. I get cleaned up. Because I'm a good looking guy and I want to stay that way. <laughs> and I, I I get cleaned up. And then my wife, she gets up, and then when the kids was little, they get up, and it's a challenge. But listen, as the spiritual head of the home, I just always understood it was my task from a holy God to set the course and to lead the home and to make sure they got in the house of God. The Lord said uh, in the text, be like a householder. Now, let the pendulum swing. Uh, As you can see in our reading in in, uh, Ephesians, the the church is involved. And and as you can see in the the reading of of Christ, the the spiritual leadership uh, of the disciples is involved. So here's the challenge the other aspect, the other side of the coin that he's talking about. Listen, as pastors, as preachers, as teachers, as singers, as servants of God in leadership roles in the church, in the church household, we must be consecrated and care. Did you get that? I want to be a preacher, pastor. Well, if you want to be a preacher, you got to be consecrated. You got to care. You, you, you know what? <laughs> After being in this thing for all the decades that I've been in and gone through all the stuff, I started to say crap, but I didn't say that, uh, that I've gone through, you know, over, over the years. I just kind of despise <laughs> some young whippersnapper or, or somebody that wants to rise up and says, well, man, I think I can really do that ministry thing. I want to be where the lights are shining on me, man. I think I got something to offer. But when it comes to putting your shoulder to the wheel, and when it, when it comes, you see, to hoisting the sails of the boat, when it comes uh, uh, to putting the cargo on the ship, when it comes to labor and faithfulness, hey, you've got other things to do. Let me tell you something. You ain't fit for the ministry. 
Ha! I ain't going to go there no more. He, he told me I can't preach unless I'm consecrated. Well, you, you, said, uh, you can't preach unless you're consecrated. Unless you care enough. To be faithful. Amen. You, you, you might well, you might well just get out. Uh, I went into the office this morning, talked to the deacon in his office, and uh, he said, "I was just reading in the bulletin here where it says if you can't stand the heat, don't get in the kitchen." You know, we need a lot fewer uh, people to have aspirations to become a minister or something in their own glory and want to be, you know, where the lights are shining on me and look at me. I'm Reverend so and so. I'm Dr. Doolittle so and so. And we need more. God called men that are willing to put their shoulder to the, to the grind and, and stay at it a year in and year out, no matter what happens. Uh, and not only preachers. Let me, let me show you something now. Years ago, it was back in the 90s. We'd gone through the expansion. Uh, of our old church building to the tune of over $250,000. And uh, had a deacon back then. And he had done pretty good, sometimes deacon, but most of the times he was the Dickens. <laughs> Did you ever know a deacon that was the Dickens? Anyway... The Lord blessed him a little bit, and he went out and bought him a boat. Now, I don't have a problem owning a boat. I owned a motorcycle once until it liked to kill me. <laughs> but anyway, about every second or third Sunday, he was over in Indiana on, on the lake fishing. And he'd done that about three times. I was gracious. And then I went up to him. I said, let me tell you something. I love you, buddy. But you're deacon at Mission Baptist Church. And you can't say a deacon at Mission Baptist Church being out there on the lake every two or three weeks on God's day. If you're going to be in servanthood, in ministry, you've got to be faithful to God's house. That's got to be the heartbeat of your life. Am I making anybody mad yet? Yeah. So, he, best I remember, he straightened up for a little bit. But, he'd been gone a long time. I mean, let me tell you something. The spiritual leadership uh, doesn't require perfection. <laughs> it requires faithful practice. And uh, listen, if you're planning on being on vacation about once a, a Every three or, or four weeks, do yourself a favor and don't get involved in any kind of ministry because your life will speak so loud, nobody can hear what you're saying. Well, let me tell you something about vacations. How many vacations do you reckon God gives a fellow a year? I'll let you answer that. I think my life has done give the count. But, uh, amen. Will you come back to church next Sunday? I knew you were going to preach like that, preacher. Well, I didn't know I was going to preach like that either. Half the time, I don't know how I'm going to preach until I get behind the sacred desk. 
But but listen. Uh, and then next, believers, believers, all of us, not only the preachers, not only the deacons, not only the, the singers. Oh, how I love Jesus, and you're gone three quarters of the time. Shut up. Uh, listen, believers, now, now get this. Boy, this is good. Believers have a treasure. <laughs> A treasure box of new things and old things. You want to know what that treasure box is? Go over there to Second Corinthians chapter number 4. And uh, you'll find it in verse number 7. In verse number 6... He talked about the glory of God shown in the face of Jesus Christ. And then he said, but we have this, <laughs> this glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. <laughs> I'm the box. And you're the box. You're the earthen treasure box but in you you have the excellency of the power and that it may be of God and not of ourselves you and I have a treasure now let me show you he, he said to share in this treasure there's new things and there's old things and just like a dad or just like a mom would go to a box containing things and with kids' eyes open wide, what's in there? And maybe dad or mom would pull out something that they'd never seen before. And they'll go play with it for three minutes. And then lay it aside. We'll want something else. But then they get down in the box and find something old they hadn't seen. In, in a while, parents, you've done that with your, with, with your, with your kids. But but here's the application to our life. You know, parents, can I tell you something? I don't want to sound mean. I've already been mean enough. I want to repent right now in the middle of the sermon and be kind the rest of the time. You think that'd be possible? But uh, listen. You know, one of the troubles in society today, one of the things that makes homes so dysfunctional and messed up, parents are trying to give their kids all the wrong things. Yeah. Trying to give the kids all the wrong things. Give them this, give them that, take them there, take them here, get them involved in that, see that, this, that, and the other. It's all the wrong things. The treasure that we really need to share with our children is the knowledge of a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what they need most from our treasure box. And may I say, dear parents, if we give our children everything in the world and they don't have Christ, at the end of the road, what really do they have? They will take nothing with them. No games. No toys. No abilities. No talents. No pursuits. Now, they'll, they'll take nothing with them. But if they have Christ, He will go with them. And they will go with Him to eternity. Uh, listen, we have new things and old to share. There are so many things in this passage. You know, uh, the, the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. You know, sometimes you need to tell your kids about old things 
and how old things can mess you up and how old things uh, in life can, can ruin you and how old things can get you on the road to hell. And then you need to tell them about something new. But you know, son or daughter, I was sitting in church and I heard the, the message of God. And I knew I needed the Lord. Have you told your kids this? I, I know I needed the Lord. And I, I called out to, to God and I, I got right with God and, and son or, or daughter. I, I'll tell you, I found the answer. I found what I needed. My life is new because of Christ and yours can be too. I've lived in newness so many decades now. And then, new things and old things, uh, we have the authority of the New Testament and we have the admonition of the old. I won't take time to read the passages, Romans 15, 4 and 1 Corinthians 10. So many things to learn from the Bible. But listen, the task of ministry is given to every one of us, not only Pastors, can I say this to you, dear families? One of the biggest mistakes church going folks make is to relegate ministry to the preacher. And just, uh, you, you know, it's kind of like a fellow I used to work with. Been a long time since I've worked a secular job. Uh, but uh, this fellow. <laughs> He's having trouble with his kid, now all kind of trouble. And um, I told him, I said, uh, uh, and he is bad to drink. And uh, I, I, I told him, I said, well, man, have you, have you thought about getting in the house of God, taking your children to Sunday school, church, and learning some, something new, learning something that will help you, uh, help you get out of this mess of this world, help that kid? Well, he said, why is it? I did that. He said, I took him over our landmark and had him baptized, but it didn't do him a bit of good. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> now, you see, you can't treat the house of God like going down Kroger's and buying a gallon of milk. I mean, you just can't go over a one-time type of thing and, and, and then go out and say, well, that didn't work. Uh, Listen, we, we, we need to center our homes around Christ and the Bible. Now, let me give you this. It, it's not just for the pastor and those assisting him. Ministry is for your, to your family. Uh, dads, you're to minister to your children. Uh, fathers, you're to minister to your wives. Uh, you're to minister. Minister together, and you're to get involved with ministering in the church. Uh, and here, I want to give you this. Every one of us, ministry must be shouldered, not shunned. It must be fulfilled, not forgotten. Then there's the trials of ministry and I have a tendency to preach too long. I'm going to shorten this. Uh, the trials of ministry. Now, if you'll listen quick, I'll speak quick. Uh, after finishing the parables uh, and presenting the task of ministry to the disciples, <laughs> he goes into his own hometown and uh, he teaches in their synagogue. But everything he did, everything he said, everything he taught was questioned and doubted and murmured against. Look at verse number 54. And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue inasmuch that they were astonished. And said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? 
uh, and his brethren, James and Joseph and uh, Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not here with us? Whence hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. Now, here's what we learn. Are you ready for this? There are trials in the ministry for those that are in the ministry, ministry, and for all of us that are in the ministry of serving the Lord and trying to live the Christian life and uh, leading our children in, in the biblical way. There are trials. Everything's not going to go smoothly for you. Don't ever think that it will go smoothly. There are trials. Uh, listen. I'm reminded now about another friend. He and I went to high school together. And afterwards, we, uh, you, you know, uh, we got straightened out with the Lord. And I became a pastor and he went into the ministry. And uh, I, I met him one day and uh, he, <laughs> he said, you know, he said, you know, Brother Bill, he said, uh, I really... I, I believe God sent me into the nursing home ministry. He called me into the nursing home ministry. I said, man, that's wonderful. Those dear people, they need you. And he said, but I went up there. Now, you got to think about this, people in the nursing home. Man, I'll tell you, Mom, when she was in the nursing home, we'd go down at Fellowship Hall, you, you know, and they'd bring in this one and that, and they were just barely alive on all kinds of different chairs and beds and stuff. And Mom, her problem was uh, uh, Alzheimer's d dementia. And, and she told me one day, I sat down there with her, and she looked around all them people, and she said, why don't they take these people to the hospital instead of bringing them down here to my house? I'll tell you right now, I'm not feeding them a thing. <laughs> I said, I don't blame you, Mom. But I said that to say this. The dear preachers that goes in to minister to those people and they bring them in and some of them, you, you know, they're, they're spent, their bodies, they... And they can't be as attentive as you people are. They can be as attentive as some of you are, uh, but they can't be as attentive as most people in church are because of their physical condition. Anyway, he, Archie, he felt like they rejected his ministry. He neither did go back. Now, now, let me tell you something, friend. God's not in that kind of stuff. When God calls you, he calls you into a ministry of sometimes and oftentimes being rejected. There's trials in the ministry. In fact, as soon as you become a believer, you have three enemies. I'm not going to take time for all these, but your, in, your flesh is your enemy. That's why you feel so daggone lazy about church time. That's why you want to stay up to midnight or one o'clock on Saturday night, push an envelope knowing you're supposed to be in Sunday school and church, but you can't resist that video game or some dumb stuff like that. That flesh, you see, you got that flesh. Now, you can already tell I'm the kind of pastor that can win friends and influence people, aren't I? <laughs> Just by the way I deal with issues. But that's the flesh enemy, yeah. He, yeah, he, he, he keep you all messed up like that. And then, you, then you'll be, oh, God, I was just so tired. I just couldn't get up. I mean, you couldn't get up. That's sad. And then there's the world. Demas, the Bible said in Second uh, Timothy 4.10, hath forsaken me having loved this present world. Now, there's a whole lot of people, uh, you just love the world too, too much to be any heavenly good. The world's just got such a pull. You got more excuses than, than uh, what was it mom used to say? Carter's got liver pills or little pills. I never could figure out which one she said, liver or little. But you got all these excuses to be involved in the world. And then there's a devil, First Peter 5, 8 and 9. And there is a devil, and he is your enemy. 
and he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And listen, you can't have victory over the flesh, but it means to follow the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. You can't have victory over the world, but it means to have faith in the Lord. Uh, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It means relying on 1 John 4, 4. Him that is in you is greater than he that's in the world. That's your victory. And your victory over the devil is to submit yourself to God. James 4, 17, 7 through 8. And just submit yourself to God and stay submitted to God. And he said, then, then you can overcome the devil. And then familiarity breeds contempt. I want you to notice this. Now, obviously, there was no fleshly display, no problem in Jesus. The Bible says he had no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Wasn't any shortcoming on his part. But listen... Those in his own home, his own household, those neighbors, his friends, that uh, they they rejected his ministry. Uh, all they're just like the rest of us, you know. He's grown up here in the community. What does he think God would use him for? And you, you know, familiar—that's a true saying. Familiarity does breed contempt. And uh, I knew a man one time, he, had, he is a sinner, obviously, and he, he had a bad, you know, he had a bad problem before he got saved. But he got saved, and his wife got saved, and they got in Sunday school and church. And he became an outstanding servant of the Lord and served to the Lord till he died. And uh, I went to his funeral a number of years ago. But anyway, I tried to win a, a, a brother-in-law of his. And in spite of how that man had changed, his brother-in-law couldn't get beyond, couldn't look beyond the time before he become a Christian and, and saw him uh, drinking and, and cursing and doing this and that. And he, he, now, now, let me tell you something. You've got to get beyond people's past. We've all got a past. You've got to get beyond people's presence. You, 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 you can't be looking at every little old thing that you think is a problem with. You better worry about your own self. That's one you better worry about. But listen, uh, he, he just, he, he was never able to do anything because that guy never looked at him after he got saved, started doing right. All he had in his mind was what he was. Now listen to me. The, did you know this? One of the hardest trials a servant of God can experience is when family and friends put you through hell with murmuring, dis disagreement, lies, outright rebellion. I've been there, done that. Never have been hurt so deeply. But familiarity breeds contempt. And a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own house. For everyone that rejects you and have a problem with you, there's somebody down the road that will love you and that will embrace you and that will stand with you. And thank God for family and friends that stands with me. I'm glad my wife stands with me. She can tell you I'm about the most perfect man that there is and she still stands with me my kids can tell you that they've had about the most perfect dad anybody in the world can have and they still stand with me thank God for in-laws that stand with me thank God for friends that know me and know my failures know some of the messes that I've made but you love me and you stand with me. Thank God for that. But let me tell you something. If you're going to serve God, whether you're in the ministry, if you're just going to come to church and live right and try to get your kids to live right, you're going to have opposition. You're going to have trials. And if you don't just set your foot down and stand up the trials, the devil will knock you out of the race and wind up destroying your whole uh, family before it's over you. Am I making any sense today or am I just rambling on? The question is, will you keep serving Christ and keep ministering 
even if it means rejection of family and friends. I'll go real quick. I'll be finished in four minutes, just like I always do. There's the terminus of ministry. Here's where I want to conclude the message. The word terminus means the end or the extremity of anything. Now look at the text, verse 58. He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You see, what God does hinges upon faith. It's faith that allows him to save you. They that come unto God must believe that he is. If you, uh, won't put your, if, if you don't have faith, if, then God can't save you if you won't put your faith in the Son of God. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is our faith that brings victory in trials. It is our faith that brings about good works. But listen, where there is no faith, God does not usually reveal himself. And God doesn't reveal the power of his word where there is no faith. God doesn't do many mighty works where there is no faith. Mark said, yeah, he done a few things. But he doesn't do many things without faith. Now, here's the conclusion of the message. Will you shake off the shackles of unbelief and believe God for a mighty work in your life? Will you shake off the shackles of unbelief and believe God for a mighty work in your life? Some of you men, you need to choose today to believe God. Just step forward and say, I'm trusting Christ as my Savior. I'm going to be the, I'm going to strive to be the spiritual head of my home. I, I, I don't, I don't want this mess of a world. I, I, I want to stand for God. Ladies, you ought to do the same. Children, you ought to do the same. Christian, you ought to do the same. If you want to be in leadership, you better follow the, the, the wishes of Christ and be dedicated and consecrated to it. Uh, Will you, listen, cast those shackles, I'll shake them off. Unbelief and believe God. Let's stand.